Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Patricia from the International Hospital Federation. I hope you're all safe and well, and thank you very much for joining us today. In March, we launched this COVID-19 webinar and live Q&A series with the aim to share experiences, good practices, and insights from our members and other organizations from around the globe. We created it with healthcare providers for healthcare providers and those involved in managing COVID-19. As we now adapt and transition to the new normal, we are ending this series with a presentation from Switzerland. We hope this session today, as well as the previous webinars, help you in facing the crisis and planning for the future. I would now like to introduce our moderator, IHF CEO, Eric Derudenbeck. Eric? Yeah, thank you, Patricia, and uh, welcome to our participants. Uh, this webinar today will take us to the canton of Fribourg in Switzerland, as you say. Like most European countries, you know, Switzerland has faced a quite severe COVID wave for which it was not prepared by past experience of epidemics. The flu is the usual communicable disease and the latest major flu epidemic was back in 1968. But Switzerland is among the countries that did well in mitigating the consequences of the COVID without stringent lockdown measures but well explained and followed containment measures. In a system that is very decentralized, hospital had to put in place response. And this is what we are going to hear about today. Like in other countries, operation center played a critical role, but in Fribourg, a partnership with an IT company specialized in design thinking was instrumental in making this command center highly effective. So let me introduce uh, to you our speakers from Fribourg. First, uh, we'll uh, hear from Dr. Ronald von Lanten, who is the chief medical officer from the Fribourg uh, Hospital, Hospital Fribourgeois in French. Uh, I don't have the uh, Swiss-German name for the uh, hospital. Um, he is an anesthesiologist and um, became uh, operating room managers, but he has been working as a change management agent to drive change processes in clinics in complex internal, uh, external political situation uh, over the last uh, years. So 15 years of active experience as a clinician, 20 years in emergency services and uh, as an emergency physician, training as a disease physician, several years as a physician in charge of uh, disaster relief battalion of the Swiss army. Uh, the army in Switzerland is a uh, army of the population. And during the Conora Corona crisis, he was a member of the Cantonal, which is the sub-region in, in Switzerland, crisis team, head of the hospital crisis team and coordinator of the regional hospital, public and private to face the, the coronavirus. Our second speaker will be Christoph Vertelgi. Uh, he's partner of the Walker Project, who is in Switzerland. He has been in design thinking and design service um, since 2007. He drives the application of design thinking in healthcare and other industries uh, in the European context. Christoph uh, has uh, worked on creating patient-centric experiences and before applying to healthcare, he has uh, embedding the, the approach in many other industries, such as banking, telecommunication, automotive, and so on. Design thinking comes with uh, the dynamic of participatory change, high speed of development, and innovation-based leadership. So this is what Christoph is going to talk about. And he is a partner from this leading healthcare consultancy company, after being part of a core teaching and research team at Stanford University. But let's start with Ronald. Uh, the floor is yours, and we'll hear first how the Fribourg Hospital has uh, coped with the COVID. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, before we really start, to uh, tell you what we did here, I would like to give you some context, uh, which I believe is important to understand um, why we did what we did here. The Swiss health system is uh, organized in a federalistic manner. We have 26 regions, we call that cantone, 
in which uh, 26 different health ministers organize healthcare largely uh, in, a independ uh, in an independent way for over 9 uh, million residents. The canton of Fribourg is further divided into seven districts. So we have a population of about 300,000 in seven districts, and every one of the districts has its own small hospital. Um, with the introduction of the DRGs in 2009, it was a political decision that these small hospitals should be merged um, into one large hospital. But uh, it was also decided that all the, the existing locations have to remain, so we couldn't close any hospitals. So today we have in the city, in the capital city, we have a larger hospital uh, with about 300 beds. And around us, in a radius of 20 kilometers, we have another four hospitals with 50 to 90 uh, hospital beds each. Uh, three of the sites have operating theaters and 24-hour uh, emergency rooms. So you see already the, the problems in our structure. The important point is that this merger of these locations was never really completed. Uh, until today, each location exists as an independent kingdom with uh, his own ruler, uh, which usually would be a chief physician. So at the beginning of the crisis, we made the same observations as anybody else. The situation was extremely dynamic, unpredictable, uh, requiring flexible, but also tight management. We needed uh, much closer cooperation and coordination in our system. That was uh, indispensable. Uh, and we also saw that our hospital crisis cell uh, was more designed for technical disasters. We had to change that to be prepared for uh, medical questions. So since uh, I myself had been uh, res a responsible medical officer of a disaster relief unit of the Swiss Army for many years, we first of all set up a situation room based on the Army model. Uh, we also suspended the usual um, time-consuming decision-making processes of our administration and formed a small group of experts who uh, could discuss uh, important questions, uh, took the necessary steps, decide immediately, and disseminate uh, those decisions through the channels of our command center. From the very beginning, we paid particular attention to the flow of information. Without timely, precise information, no good decisions can be made. And in our special situation with uh, five locations that actually do not talk to each other usually, the flow information was also a special challenge. Uh, my colleague Christoph will speak about uh, wow. that later. Um, I would like to reference to an important effect we have achieved by collecting information. Uh, I'll give you an example. We required for a daily report on material and medication inventory from the logistics department. On the first day, we received information that we have 10,000 liters of liquid oxygen. Uh, I'm an anesthetist, but this information is, has no meaning to me. I don't know what to do with uh, 10,000 liters of liquid oxygen. So we asked for calculations of how long we can last with this amount of oxygen in different scenarios. And we asked them that they do the, the calculation every day. So this meant that the logistic, logistic department, which usually just placed an order for oxygen when the tank had reached a certain level, now had to keep a constant eye on the daily consumption, uh, develop delivery solutions for, for various scenarios, identify supply, uh, supply chain risks, and, and search for alternatives. The whole logistic processes had to be analyzed, reconsidered, and adapted. Um, all our divisions and services had to think over the procedures and in the end, to have that number on a whiteboard on our wall was not a real success. 
success was the improved process behind these figures. Um, as I mentioned before, we started with a low-tech solution, military style, whiteboards on the wall, uh, all information uh, written manually. However, it soon became clear that we needed more automation in our reporting. That was the moment when uh, Walker Project came on board, a partner we know well from other project, projects we have done with them. And we asked them not only to implement modern technology, but also to improve the quality of our data, uh, improve the procedures in our command center in general, and help us to reach um, some kind of a next level in quick decision making. That's what uh, Christoph uh, will now talk about. Christoph? Thank you, Raoult, uh, for this overview what I will explain you a little bit more more detailed by now if you're all wondering what this fell down cow is about and uh, that that ronald didn't uh, link to is uh, it's a funny story i'd like to share because a, a few weeks before the whole crisis came up uh, part of our team uh, had a, a workshop with the management team uh, and with ronald of course of the of the Fribourg hospital and uh, during a storm overnight this cow fell down so, uh, and we took this as symbolic um, picture to say, okay, let's, let's help to, let's help this cow to stand up again. And, and, and I close the loop uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, let me share a little bit of, uh, of the experience in terms of um, how did we approach this challenge that the uh, Hospital of Fribourg was giving us in terms of, okay, let, let's uh, move on with the next generation of this uh, operation center as, as uh, Ronald has already outlined. Um, the video that they will share doesn't show only um, images and pictures from, from Fribourg. It shows like prototyping zones. Uh, which are, um, I would say, uh, tell you a good impression about innovation, how innovation is being fostered internationally in hospitals, also for non-COVID times. So um, the methodology, which, which was already mentioned as design thinking, helped also in this case to really address the COVID-19 challenges. So let me start the video. And there is no sound. I will talk about the, the, the images that you see here. Uh, but three main topics basically occur when you see in the video. In Fribourg, we, dev we developed every part of the solution with, uh, with physicians, nurses, logistics. And uh, one of the, the most important thing was to have all the decision makers together to decide what the solution should be about. What Ronald has already initiated in that, I would say, analog version of it, uh, we took it to the next step by having all the people uh, being part of that development of the next generation of this uh, operation center that I will show later on. Second, we based our so different solutions element on, on lean principles. So we wanted to foster very efficient and, and also value adding processes for leadership, but also for operations. Ronald also said before, he wanted to have a way quicker decision-making process. Uh, this was one of the, the, the key principles we wanted to address. Of course, we want to, to enable transparency throughout the crisis at the right time, and also to take those rapid uh, decision processes. And thirdly, there was no final solution because the situation needed a lot of agility throughout the, the different phases. Uh, so we've based our work on this design thinking, which is our, our leading development approach. And it bases on prototype um, of different prototypes, which are always the next generation of the previous prototype. So we iterate a lot in having the next generation. And uh, as, as Ronald has already said, there was an analog version first, and then there was a first digital version, but kind of every single day, we improved our prototype and we came along with, with even better solution. That was the, the, the approach that we've chosen. It was, it was highly efficient uh, because we had um, the, 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 the possibility to, to, uh, to implement and in parallel develop the next version of it. And what you see here is the, uh, the core of, of this, um, I would say, brain uh, of the decision-making process, the so-called operation center. Um, and this was also the brain for this crisis management. The operation center uh, itself went live within about seven days in that version that you, kind of that version that you, that you see here. 
it consisted basically of four different elements. So um, one element, uh, which, which Ronald already said, is the information flow. We needed to implement a very standardized information flow, which assured that the relevant information uh, coming from the front line, wards like ED and ICU, of course, and, and back to those, uh, was articulated towards the decision uh, team and then back again to the front line. Typically, uh, it took about 90 minutes uh, from articulating the problem and then going back with a decision or at least having uh, initiated a problem solving uh, path. Secondly, uh, it was the, of course the care model uh, which was integrated, for example, team huddles uh, when the nurses and the physicians in the ward itself gathered. Uh, in a pre with a predefined set of, of relevant information that they needed to gather uh, to articulate those relevant information towards this operation center. And uh, also a hospital group wide standards calendar. That means that every decision and every process was made at, this, at the same time independently in which, in which um, um, location you were. And thirdly, of course, the cockpit itself. The cockpit shows some visualization. As you see here, we'll show them a little quicker uh, right afterwards. Uh, you see like patient numbers, collaborator availabilities. You also see materials uh, that became scarce and so on. So the relevant data was there to anticipate uh, what the next step should be. And then of course, last but not least, uh, the control room itself that you see the picture of here, uh, which was the room where all the information came together and the decision-making team was what gathered to really manage this, this crisis. Um, here you see a 2D floor plan to show you which teams were in this uh, uh, operation center setting. So you see, for example, middle like staff planning uh, was in there. You see like patient flow management was in there, logistics, of course, IT, communication. So all the relevant uh, staff was there and of course it was led by um, Ronald at the very beginning and then a colleague of him took over as, as chief medical officer in that operation center and of course also the, the chief nurse officer was part of the, the decision team. So it was a, a highly efficient uh, gathering of all those decision makers. How did the standardized information flow work from the front line? Um, you need to embed a very standardized way of having uh, the, the information gathered. So every single ward, every single ED and every single ICU had to gather it the same way and had to gather the same amount of information. And of course, uh, all the different sites uh, had to gather the same amount of information. So uh, you had to have a very structured way of having those, uh, I would say, all different kind of information standardized, but gathered towards that command and operation center to have the decision being made. This was one of the first thing uh, we've embedded. Here's some, some bigger visualizations of the cockpit. Uh, you see like the upper left the overview of how many cases of COVID you have in there, how many beds uh, are free, what's, what's the, the staff availability at the moment, the resources uh, on the upper uh, right hand, and the upper right, uh, the lower right side of this visualization shows you uh, the very pragmatic way of the first version of gathering the relevant information in terms of an Excel. So every ward had the possibility to uh, write in some of the um, questions they've had, like, okay, um, how should we differentiate our room structure for COVID and non-COVID-19 cases? So these uh, questions were articulated towards this operation center and the operation center team could address those questions directly in their daily meeting, which was very, very, very important. Um, it soon became very, very clear, uh, you, as, as it was already uh, mentioned, the, the whole situation started or, or was, was kind of nearly exploding in terms of what the pro prognosis was. So it was very important to have an escalation plan at hand, which gave the, the whole hospital a clear structure. When do we need to move from one escalation uh, level to the next? Also connected, of course, to some resources like logistic resources or staff, which needed to be, be activated. Um, 
what became clear in about two weeks after the whole crisis really started in Switzerland is what if the prognosis were right, we couldn't address the capacity demand uh, with the existing structure. So we needed to implement at least a plan uh, to have this plan at hand when the whole thing would, would explode and, and became not handleable in the existing structure anymore. So what, what was made? Um, we needed an alternative scenario uh, to avoid a totally pandemic medicine. And from that moment on, Ronald and we started to plan for a COVID-19 hospital, which uh, stand on its own shoulders and had its own structure uh, of functioning. I'll give you uh, a short overview of the layout which was um, defined. Uh, I wouldn't go into details. We are happy to address, of course, a lot of questions con concerning this structure. But the main thing that was developed was a pot structure. And this pot structure that you see in the upper left of the slide was the core of this COVID-19 uh, hospital. The pot itself uh, is strongly defined by different flows. Uh, so one flow, for example, is the dirty material flow on, visualized, visualized by a yellow path. So all the, uh, or the, the, all the clean structure coming in in such a pod uh, from one side and all the dirty structure, for example, leaving this, uh, this care zone uh, on the uh, left side of this picture. So you had a very a clear and very standardized way of how material, how staff, how information would be handled within this COVID-19 um, uh, hospital. One of the main, um, one of the main uh, thoughts behind this was to um, address the problem of having not enough resources to handle such a, such a big crisis. So we've had to have a, a structure which helped us with a minimal amount of, of, uh, of capacity of staff uh, addressing a lot of different uh, COVID-19 cases. And that was also one of the main uh, arguments behind this uh, COVID-19 Hospital. As you see here, one pod would be supervised by, by one assistant physician, one certified nurse, two nurse assistants, and one physiotherapist. This would be the staff handling one pod. And the, another uh, positive element, I would say, of, of this uh, modular structure was that we could scale it up depending on demand of this, uh, of this whole crisis. So uh, we said, each pod could accommodate approximately 10 patients uh, in total. And if we need more, we just add some more pods to the basic structure. So we could expand until 600 uh, patients in a, in a normal scenario and even more about 1,200 if it really wanted to get it extreme. So a very uh, important element to give us, I would say, uh, kind of a safe feeling if the whole escalation plan wouldn't work out, uh, we have an alternative at hand to be prepared for, for the worst. So that uh, was a very, very important element uh, for all this. Maybe to wrap up uh, our, our part before we, we enter into discussions, uh, let, let, let's see how we, we were able to, to help those cows standing up again to take on the symbolic uh, image again from the very beginning. So we needed to be very, very clear of give the patient what he needs now. We wanted to have a very robust care model uh, along the development of the whole crisis and after, of course, and foster this transparency over to the, the whole system to take decisions very timely, very speedy, and, and I would say very stable. Second point maybe was about doing the right thing at the right time by standardizing all those operations, decentralizing problem solving, like having teams in the ward, in ED, in ICU, being prepared for the worst by having like clear standards to be followed, for example, along this escalation plan. Uh, and thirdly, but not least, of course, uh, we wanted to use the expertise and the resources in the system, which was already in there, right? As Ronald has already said, we couldn't, um, I would say, invent everything from the scratch. So we had to take the data, which was already in there, and we had to build different levels of prototypes based on this data uh, in a continuous way to improve the solution 
kind of day by day, step by step. We want, of course, not to become an isolated island in that operation center. We want to be strongly connected with the front line, the ICU and the ED. Um, and it, 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 was, it was pretty um, intensive to see how at 8.30 in the morning, the whole decision team gathered in a very effective way and addressed all daily problems and took decision in a very quick and data-based manner, which helped, of course, to, to give uh, security back into the system and to keep, to keep the whole situation kind of calm throughout the crisis. And luckily, we never had to, to move along the escalation plan pretty up um, um, during all those crises. But it was good to have that plan uh, at hand. Now we are, of course, uh, very happy to, to, to answer questions, uh, maybe to, to dig deeper into very specific um, elements of this model. And, and I'd like to, to um, come back to Eric, you are the leader of our Q&A session. So thank you both of you for, for the presentation. I think it's a very comprehensive and interesting approach. You, you end up with the key messages that are more, more or less outlined, you know, what was important to drive effectively the response. I have a question that was raised, which is, what are the factors of success? Because we heard very well, you know, how you have mastered the processes, but what made this process successful? What are the factors that you could bring forward from both of you that uh, you, you could uh, recommend as, as essential for such an approach to be successful? I don't know, Christoph, you wanna? Would you like? Uh, well, ma maybe uh, I would say first to, to put that all in place in two to three weeks um, was the first success we had because um, for once, everybody had the same goal. Um, everybody wanted to master the crisis. Everybody wanted to help with the crisis. And, and so everybody was willing to put aside his uh, personal uh, private interests and, and uh, let's say work for the community. That was not just the case in the hospital, uh, also around us, for example, I give you an example. We had a problem with the uh, oxygen tubing in the new hospital. Um, usually you have to do a copper based oxygen tubing and that would have cost uh, like five millions and uh, three uh, weeks of building time we didn't have. So I just took uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, I just, I just took the phone, I called someone up, uh, uh, here nearby, who has, um, who is a, who works in that, and they showed up here, uh, uh, three guys together, a team, and they brought us in three or four days a new solution. Um, they were ready to put that in. Um, there was never any questions asked about how much that would be, how much the work would cost. It was just everybody was ready to help. So that was the, the basis for, for what we achieved next. Maybe Christoph could uh, talk about that. Yes, absolutely agree, Ronald. Um, I think one, one additional point was this, uh, this, this co-designing uh, by having a, a first version at hand very, very quickly, but in parallel listening to the organization and to the decision uh, people um, bring back some feedback to the current um, model, to the current information, and then having this model being uh, developed step by step to an even better solution. So we had a strong agility in the development process, and I think this raised the acceptance for having this model at hand uh, pretty quickly. And of course, another point was having this transparency. I think one of the key thing that typically and usually hospitals don't have is like having real-time transparency what is going on in my processes where are my people what kind of resource do i have typically they have to call like 35 times to to find some information and we want to avoid this because this would would even bring more uh insecurity into the system so having just this transparency um raised uh, the awareness towards this this uh, this operation center and by the way 
um, this could be um, move forward into a new normal, having in a post-COVID place because transparency, maybe with other other indicators, but having this transparency for ORs, uh, having transparency in terms of ED resources, having transparency in terms of bed is always critical for a hospital. It's not just for the for the COVID nineteen uh, crisis. But from the example that you you shared with us, you we see that uh, an external uh, consultancy company company played a very important role in in supporting the hospital in developing solutions and bringing tools. Uh, I guess this was possible because you had uh, already ongoing projects. Uh, how would a hospital who has not been, you know, involved with a company similar as yours, uh, uh, with the same kind of tools and ongoing project, would, would ha have it, it be possible? Is, is the fact that you were on board already allowing this quite uh, scale up and uh, quick response uh, that would never have been possible if, if this relation was not existing before? Well, let, let me start maybe. We, we thought a lot about this, to be honest, from, uh, from us as, as being this external part. And we were all very conscious that uh, knowing this, this, uh, this organization already, knowing the decision making, people already helped us a lot in terms of speed, right? We could never have been so fast, I think, if we didn't know the structure and, and who to address for which kind of, which kind of questions. And this wasn't, wouldn't be able, I think, if you don't know this organization at all. Uh, so this was one of the key success factor, of course. Um, you can apply this method to every, every single environment, that's not the thing. But uh, in terms of crisis, having needs, the need of being very, very quick, you need to have some previous knowledge about the surrounding. Absolutely. Maybe, Ronald, you'd like to add your view. I guess uh, first step is uh, for a hospital is to see the opportunity. Of course, we had contact with, uh, with a Walker Project. We had uh, worked with them. But... Um, I guess uh, we needed first to see the opportunity of the situation and you, you have to be willing to, to do something like that. And then uh, the, the contact to Walker project and the project itself came, came naturally. Um, you, I, I guess you, you really need someone um, who, uh, well, yeah, you need someone who, who sees the opportunity and who wants to go that way and who leads the way uh, at the beginning. When Walker Project came in and uh, people saw uh, what they could do and how they could help us, uh, it was all natural after that. Uh, there were, were no discussions, but we had also in the hospital, we had discussions about is this really the moment to bring in uh, someone from the outside, even if we know him? Is this the moment to change everything? Um, I guess that's, that's where our differences in the response of hospitals in the crisis, there were some who wanted to just uh, continue what they do because that felt, that, that felt more secure. And, and we just knew that in our situation, we, we needed some change. So that's what we went for. So, but you, you have gone a long way, I mean, from the beginning to, to now, and you have developed a number of very interesting solutions you have shared with us. At this stage, would you say that these solutions can be products that could be adopted now like that by other hospitals, or it is a journey? for which you know any hospital has to develop his own customized uh, uh, approach and solution can you now you know for example share your experience with any hospitals that would be uh, willing to adopt what you have developed with fine tuning and the marginal customization or would each of them need to go through the whole journey you have gone through Um, in my opinion, everybody can do that. Um, the principles are always the same. It needs some fine tuning. It needs adaption to a special situation, but the principles are the same for everybody everywhere. So, uh, yeah, I guess 
if someone is willing to do it, uh, you can do that everywhere, any anytime. It's a very important, very important question. Um, I, I do accompany a lot of hospitals in terms of restructuring their ED, for example. And then um, when we are talking about the starting point of the project, they ask me, but you know about best practices in ED. And I always tell them, yes, we could model the best practice worldwide of an ED maybe in two hours, but you will be the first telling me that our hospital is very special and it will need a special solution. So it's two-sided, right? It's twofold. On one hand, of course, the, the rational would say, hey, those core principles, you can take them to any other hospital because having transparency about uh, OR capacity, checking out your outpatient plan, are you in the plan or not? I mean, these are worldwide indicators you need. On the other hand, there are experts behind those uh, systems and you need to take them on that journey to develop their very own system. And even if you land at the, at the best practice solution, still, uh, they will need to have that, that experience of creating their own solution uh, to go through it. It's something that I, I uh, often um, observe um, working with a lot of different expert organizations in comparison to my old world where I was with, with, with banking or telecom telecommunication, which is much more less expert organization than, than hospitals, obviously. So it, it's two-sided, yeah. The rational would say, yes, take on those, those uh, elements to any other hospital. And the human side of it says, okay, you have to, to create that platform, which we uh, serve as a, with the design thinking approach and to give the experts to, the, the, the momentum of creating their own solution. So it's, it's really, I mean, there is a mock-up, but there is a journey, if I can yeah. summarize. Yeah. You, you underscored at the beginning of the, Ronald, of, of your presentation, you know, the, the importance of these little kingdoms, you know, we are familiar with in the healthcare landscape and uh, the fact that uh, the coordination was a key element that was put together. Would you, would you say that thanks to what you have developed, you achieved a, a really, a, a, a major progress? And if you really have, have achieved it, do you think that you have come to a point that there will be no uh, return back? That means that somehow, even though the kingdom will stay, because in the healthcare sector, I, I don't think this is easy to, 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 to make disappear, but the kingdom will become now more collaborative kingdoms instead of being independent kingdoms. And that's, a, uh, that's a, something that is a gain for, for the future, whatever is going to happen. Um, that's a very, very difficult question. <laughs> I tried to give you a good answer. The problem is, um, we put that in place, uh, very rapidly. So we just needed two, three weeks to, to put that in place. And with that, we did change everything, but the crisis was not long enough to, to show people, to, to really let them live in that new system. So when the curve came down, when we didn't have uh, any more patients, when the lockdown was over, everybody in the whole system did everything to get back to normal, the, the pre-COVID normal. This was uh, inevitable. Um, if we would have the crisis a couple of weeks uh, longer, we could have um, we could have further de developed the system and and put it in place in a way that we really really can keep it that way. So right now we are trying to figure out how we can take that system and and um, use it in the post COVID. We are again in a state where you have to discuss everything with everybody. So it's uh, much slower. So on, the, on, 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 on one hand, everybody saw, really everybody saw the advantage of a, of, of a command center of a system like that, but also everybody had some disadvantages, shift in power, shift in decision-making. And so the people wanted to go back to their normal. 
the big advantage we have today is that during the crisis, during that work, during that better communication and all the information we gathered, we, we have today a better understanding of our hospital, of, our, of the surrounding hospitals. Uh, we know each other much better. Um, there is more trust than before. And so cooperation is already better. So we had on different levels, we had advantages and disadvantages, but uh, it's, it's true to, to really do it in a way that you can keep it after the crisis. It would have taken a little bit longer. But when we have um, a second wave, we're going to be ready. Christoph, anything you would like to add? Oh, no. Okay. There is a question about, you know, the, you, you show the escalation process. Uh, on the days you had faced the highest time of escalation, were there any special, special decisions you had to make? Uh, and uh, did, did you have to mitigate what you had planned? That means the reality, w w did the reality influence your uh, perspective or your plans? You, you talked about it, itera it, iteration. How, how did it work at the moment where the crisis was, was really the most acute? I think one of the gaining part was that we were developing all the time. So even if when the, the crisis got more and more intensive, uh, we, were, we were able to, to, to run through those development cycles. And of course, when it was kind of the highest peak, uh, I think it was about the 25th or so of March, uh, Ronald uh, and part of our team discussed what if we what should we do when when the crisis explodes explodes and we cannot handle the, those capacity needs and then was one of the special decisions that we have uh, made was to to go into a COVID-19 hospital structure and we started to develop this part uh, being able to to have this ready within uh, two or three weeks uh, from that moment on so that was one of the of the key decisions but luckily to be honest due to this very agile way of developing even uh, in in the more intensive part of the crisis we were just going our normal development way so we, we moved along and developed the new version of it which was not abnormal it was like how we approached the whole crisis and um, so i think that the, the the approach itself was stable and gave some stability into the system uh, and of course, um, one other decision was, do we need to move up this escalation plan onto the next level? Um, and there were a lot of discussions about it. If we, want, if we needed to go from, from B to C and activate more, more capacity for the COVID-19 patients within the hospitals, uh, what kind of oxygen, for example, as Ronald has outlined, do we need now? Do we need more? Do we need more logistic support? And uh, these were all very intensive discussions during that phase, yeah. Uh, I would like to add that uh, a big problem for us was uh, we were on a very steep slope uh, at some time uh, on our curve. So when we had uh, 25 um, patients on respirators, we were doubling um, the cases um, every three days. So we knew we have 25 now, we're going to have 100 in, in six days. And I uh, would like to underline our normal capacity for, for uh, intubated patients is 12 normally, and we were already on 25. And we knew we could do um, 80 because um, that's also something we learned about our hospital. Uh, we knew that our our oxygen tubing system could handle uh, the oxygen flow for 80 patients, not more. So we knew that 80 is the absolute maximum we can do. And um, in this phase, uh, of course, the discussions were sometimes uh, difficult because we were in a situation where, where we would think in six days we're gonna we're gonna have four more, uh, four times more patients, and it will. Um, overpass our capacity, what, what can we do, how we do it, but um, we, we could stick to this, this planning process that Christoph um, um, described and that gave also some kind of, of security because you, you learn 
that you can handle every situation when you stick to that plan. I think that was a, a, um, a big relief and a big um, point of comfort for everybody involved. Uh, it's, it's interesting because there is uh, some discussion, you know, around the, the intensive care bed capacities of hospitals and uh, the fact that in many Western countries, we have closed down the hospitals. So do you think that uh, with the, the kind of approaches that you have put in place, uh, this is not the right debate? Because if you have the agility and the capacity to adapt, as you have demonstrated, uh, if we have to face another crisis of that nature, we would not be better off with uh, uh, two, twice as many standard ICU beds than you, you normally need, but more the capacity to adapt rather than to have permanently more uh, capacity, which is one a big push, you know, we, we have in some of the countries. What, what's your take on that? Well, um, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think we should uh, just um, build more beds everywhere for and maybe never using them. Um, uh, we could um, we could buy another another uh, fifty ventilators for for two million uh, Swiss francs and store them somewhere. But I don't I don't think that will help uh, for the crisis. Um, this flexibility, this agility, uh, this capability to to uh, change the number of beds. I think that's an important thing, and. Um, I don't know if you have seen it uh, on our escalation model. We also had um, always a description of what kind of medici medicine we're going to do. For example, we knew that we can do 50 ICU beds uh, when we put all our anesthetists, uh, all our staff from, from ORs um, uh, in there, and we can do, we can treat 50 patients with a let's say moderate standard um, care. That's, that's what we can do. Everything above 50 patients, we would have to use um, personnel from other units who are not really prepared to work under those conditions. So we knew uh, everything uh, over 50 patients will be um, a less good uh, quality in care. And, and we knew we couldn't do more than 80. So that's that where the constrictions, that, uh, that's where we just um, had uh, some sort of limits. And I, I believe we should, for, for, the next, um, for the next wave, we should just prepare to be agile. I, I must say we had, um, we had, in our healthcare region, we had a model, we had a, a curve who was uh, made by, by some specialists here in the region uh, who predicted for us um, at one point at the peak, 2,000 patients um, in, ho in the hospital, 2,000 the same day. And we have usually 580 beds. And with uh, the structure that Christoph uh, showed before, we could have done 600 um, other beds. And we knew we're gonna, if we have a wave like that, we're gonna have a situation where we have 1,200 patients, double the amount we have usually. We have um, 200 patients uh, intubated, and there are still 800 patients who, who, who would need a bed. So we just knew we can never, a wave like that, we just can't handle it. You cannot be pre pre uh, prepared for everything. It's just not possible. So I, I guess you have to do the best you can um, and you have to prepare for that. But when, when a, a wave like that hits you, well, you just do what you can. So agility, you know, with the equipment, the environment is very important, but what about the workforce? Because it seems that's more, that's really what you said, the, the bottleneck. When you had the crisis, you know, how did you keep it motivated? Did they have to work uh, extra time, a lot of overload? What, what is, has been the experience with the, the people? 
Um, motivation was never the problem. Um, uh, and the contrary, um, we, we closed down uh, our hospital um, in March. We stopped everything to be prepared for, for the wave. So we just um, uh, made the usual uh, emergency operations and stuff like that. But we, we didn't have uh, consultations. We, we stopped everything. So we had a big part of our personnel who went home and waited for the wave. And most of, of, of those people were very unhappy because they wanted to participate. Um, they wanted to work in the hospital. Um, fun fact, um, usually we have about um, uh, 90 people who, who call in sick every day. During the COVID crisis, we had, we had up to 25 um, 20, 25 collaborators who were COVID positive, and we still had uh, just 80 to 90 uh, people who called in sick. So that shows that people were really, really motivated to, to participate in that. That was never a problem. The ICU, who was the only unit who was really hit hard, who had a lot of work, um, they replaced a lot of uh, uh, anesthetists, uh, anesthetist nurses, and at the end of the crisis, we managed to to uh, not have any um, more working hours per person than they usually do. So we, we managed to do that without uh, more hours work. They have they had longer shifts, but they also had more uh, free time between shifts. Yeah, thank you. And this is very critical because the, the people is the most important element for, for uh, our industry. Uh, we are coming to the end of the, the webinar. Let me share with you a few takeaway messages I, I was able to, to grasp uh, from your presentation and I'll give you back the floor for final comments. So definitely in highly decentralized system with uh, number of small health units, the big uh, uh, challenge is to be working better together, especially when you are not prepared. And here the critical element is the, the mastering the flow of information. And for that, it's, it's very important. The fact that there is an existing uh, structure to respond to natural disaster with command and control uh, unit is, uh, is certainly important because it allows at least at an early stage of the crisis uh, to be able to better bear with it before you can go to, to the next stage. The other very important thing that you demonstrate is that uh, while you think that on crisis, you know, everybody is trying just to, to mitigate the urgency, it doesn't prevent to quickly implement a very innovative approach. On the contrary, it allows to mobilize all the stakeholders in a participatory way with a quick and rapid decision uh, making system. So uh, the crisis, it doesn't mean, you know, it's uh, the panic. <laughs> it's on the contrary, it can be an opportunity for accelerating a transformation with full participation of, of everybody. Design thinking has been proven through your, your experience to be a very effective tool because it's an interactive approach. And this, where you are, you know, you implement what, and you develop, and you implement, and you develop, is certainly in a situation like that. But I would say overall for healthcare, uh, something that, that is uh, helping in, in finding solutions. It is also very important to work on the hypothesis and always planning for the worst case scenarios. And as we have uh, heard from the last uh, uh, discussion and comments, uh, we really uh, have to work on the limitation of the, the staff because at the end of the day, the real true bottleneck is the capacity of the people to, to be uh, present, even though there is a great moral and a great willingness to do a lot of, of things. What also is, is important, and you, you, you demonstrated in your last slide, is that the organization needs to have a high level of clarity on the objectives. You clearly wanted to, to focus on what the patient need. 
you clearly wanted to make sure that you have a system that was working on priorities and you clearly wanted to leverage all the existing resources. So you really had a very good clarity on the, the framework and the objectives. And last but not least, uh, uh, a crisis is also an opportunity for trust building. And uh, this trust building is the way for creating a more collaborative uh, health system within a region. And uh, there is here, and I would say, a, a positive uh, uh, side effect of, of uh, facing a crisis like that in this uh, trust building and uh, stronger collaboration that hopefully will uh, last and, and grow. Now I'll leave it to you for final comments and after we'll go to Patricia for closing our webinars. I really thank you for your contribution and very interesting uh, insights and comments. Who wants to start first, Ronald? Okay, thank you. Um, I guess um, we, have, we had a very interesting, uh, it was a hard time, but it was a very interesting time um, we did learn a lot. Um, we're going to be much better prepared for, for a second wave. Um, and uh, we are ready to go. And I would like to thank also Christoph uh, for the work we did together the, the, this couple of weeks. Thank you. Let me thank you, Ronald, because uh, as you have already outlined in a very modest way, but you need like people like Ronald taking the initiative and seeing the opportunity. And maybe as, as a closing remark for all the participants in this webinar, it's, it's, it's uh, interesting to reflect on how shall we monitor capacity, how shall we monitor, um, I would say, our speed of decision in the future, because uh, COVID-19 won't be the last thing to, to address, right? So we have to be able to somehow create within hospitals a, a model, a, a, an operation center so-called to have this data and this decision process at hand. If we don't uh, achieve this, it will always be a restart, a new start of approaching such, such crisis or even daily management. So I think this operation center should be something which, which should be part of every core management system um, for, for any hospital. Um, so that's that's my final thought and maybe an inspiration for all the participants. And thank you, Eric. Thank you, Patricia, for having us. It was, was great talking to you. So thank you for both of you and great yeah, to give this insight of what's going to be the next normal, Christoph. Patricia, the floor is yours for closing the webinar. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Ronald, Christoph, thank you again for all the information you shared for contributing to this webinar. Um, to all our attendees, we have had several webinars in the past few weeks as part of this series. Um, if you would like to watch a recording of those, you can also watch them right now. Just go to wwwihf fihorg webinars. So I hope you all have a lovely morning, afternoon, or evening ahead of you. Please stay safe and healthy. Together, we'll overcome this crisis. Thank you again for joining us today. Ronald and Christoph, thank you again for your time. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice uh, day or evening. Goodbye.